the data that you're collecting uh, across uh, multiple devices or from mobile applications. Then from there, you're going to analyze. So in some of the cases that we work with, you're going to be analyzing it through maybe some speech-to-text service, or you may be doing some machine learning, or you're just actually feeding it into a, a web admin that allows a business user to make decisions based upon the information that's being collected. Uh, but I think part of it is you're moving through this process. You want to identify how the analyzing phase is going to be addressed. Is it going to be done by a human, or is it going to be done through some machine learning? And then the, the last part is, once you have all the information, how are you going to spit it back out to a consumer uh, to make a decision around a buying or, uh, or a purchase? Uh, how are you going to present information around maybe if you have connected devices within a building? How will you present that to a business unit or user to make decisions about a facility? Or if, there's, uh, if you have a, a device that's actually, uh, in one case that we're working with, a user can submit a help ticket to the platform, and then that's dynamically pushed to the right team or unit. Uh, so how do you present that to a unit that should get that help ticket and make a decision or act upon that? So really thinking about from the beginning to end, collecting the, the information, how you communicate it, where you store it, and how you process it to allow it to be either sent to the business users or presented to customers to make the, a buying decision or, or to engage your platform in a unique way. So I want to talk a little bit about the building blocks that we use uh, and the process of developing these trifectas. Uh, we primarily do a lot of our work around JavaScript. Uh, we like it for a few different reasons. Uh, you can, it's easier to find JavaScript developers versus some of the other specialized skill sets. Uh, React and Node have matured really quickly to be really solid platforms to build these types of services on. So we do a lot of our work around React, React Native, and, and a lot of the Node libraries. So I definitely recommend if you're, you're wanting to kind of start to do more of this work to look to the React and Node world. Uh, the mean stack for development of this type of work. Uh, when we're looking at kind of communicating some of these connected devices, uh, we use two of these libraries pretty consistently, the Johnny5 and uh, Cyclone. We're really good resources when you're looking to either use beacons or other connected devices or really solid libraries to build off on uh, for these types of uh, these platforms. Uh, we work with one of our partners, solid platform. It is a licensed software, uh, but what they do provide is a really solid black backend service that's really nice for developing classes. We use it really for a lot of our prototyping MVP clients to be able to uh, stand up an instance really quickly. They have a really quick way to develop classes uh, and a really solid uh, SDK across, you know, from Node to native apps. So it's a really nice way to be able to implement products really quickly not have to worry about building some custom backend or CMS, which they also provide a service for that. And then this particular uh, example, they have a service called Flow. So it's an integration tool. So we can take uh, Dropbox, Box, um, a number of kind of enterprise services, link them together, and through kind of a WYSIWYG editor, be able to connect them. You can still do some custom coding through Node within their platform but it allows you to kind of, in a sense, create a quick middleware for a, a quick prototyping project. So it's a really quick way to be able to take an idea, uh, want to show it to a client really quickly, and be able to develop an idea before you have to spend hours and hours and hours and kind of creating custom code. Uh, again, I'm pretty much everyone's probably familiar with Heroku, but uh, it just keeps, makes our life really easy to be able to address um, getting projects off the ground. But Heroku is definitely a go-to for us. Also on the mobile side, as you're thinking about the mobile development, it's pretty much a, a needed tool at this point when you're thinking about trifectas is to develop a mobile application. Um, and for us, we tend to do the, motor, the native approach, uh, but for those who are still trying to get off the ground, Ionic is a, a good alternative uh, to developing mobile applications since it's HTML and JavaScript-based cross-platform tool. So if you don't have the native chops within your organization, then Ionic's the next best thing to be able to get a mobile application off the ground. Uh, and one step above that is going the React Native route. Uh, it's still pretty, pretty young. The one downside around React is because of its, its kind of younger stage that it's in, you may not have all the libraries you need to support the project you're working on, or if they're there, you have to put a lot of work to kind of manipulate them to make them work for your project. So that's where we tend to still go the native route, particularly if we're going to work with connecting our device to sensors and things like that. There's more libraries that will be able to support the work that we're going to do, but 
looking at React as an alternative if you don't have a native developer <clears throat> on your team. Uh, and then the IoT side, that's probably one area that it's, it's pretty much a free-for-all. There's so many new devices coming out. Uh, and so I think part of it is a little bit of a trial and error when it comes to figuring out the right connected devices or sensors that make sense for the projects that you're going to develop towards. Uh, ones that we really like are the Estimo beacons. I have a couple of them here. Uh, they have a really great platform to be able to get your, your product and get these beacons out to kind of a production or kind of testing process. They have a kind of SDK as well as a cloud service that allows you to kind of be able to keep track of the beacons where they're at, can uh, change their max and min numbers, and be able to dynamically do that through a cloud service. So they're really great, really great way to start bootstrapping and really starting to get your head wrapped around kind of beacons and uh, playing around with these. And they have a, on their platform, they have a couple sample apps that you can pretty much download and start manipulating really quickly to really start testing and playing around with some of these ideas. So I definitely highly recommend if you're looking for getting your feet wet in the connected side, SMO beacons. Uh, I think this pack is about $100 for like three. And then if you're looking for like a larger implementation, you can get like an enterprise uh, deal with them where you can get, and get a large bag of them uh, for implementation. Uh, for more kind of enterprise um, implementations of beacons, there's a solution called uh, Beacon Grid. So the difference with these guys is that they actually implement the beacons through kind of wall sockets. So instead of having to kind of get one of these beacons, take the sticky off, stick it in a corner somewhere, and then mark somewhere in your service, like this thing is in a corner, um, and then you don't have to look at these. I mean, some people may like the shape and color of these, but it may not work for a more enterprise client. Uh, it's a small kind of kit that has temperature sensors, uh, some Wi-Fi sensors, a few different kinds of base, basic components that you may need to get your first kind of connected device off the ground. So using the Groove Kit is one quick way to be able to uh, get the components you need to start creating your first connected device to be able to prototype and then be able to kind of have a proof of concept and then you can um, take to your client. On the AI side, we, um, we've been using the service API.ai. Uh, Google recently acquired it, so it's in this uh, interesting place. We'll see how long it stays uh, a unique product of itself. Uh, but ideally, what's probably going to happen is going to move into Google's uh, cloud service, speech um, uh, cloud service at some point. But right now, it's still a standalone product. But by itself, it's a really, really great product for getting the speech to text service uh, off really quickly because you're able to define the intents uh, through a really nice interface and then be able to uh, put all the alternatives of how the intents could be fired off from your product or through a mobile application. Um, and what's also good about them, they have some fallback, just generic fallbacks around responses if your, the intents fail, uh, as well as being able to connect in web hooks to your own platform really easily. So, if you're looking to get off the ground really quickly around a speech to text service, API to AI is definitely a good place to start. It's a little bit about our process to actually you know, take all these tools and blocks and different tools and libraries. Uh, and our process actually get to a cloud platform. Uh, we took a few different steps to get there. Uh, before we, uh, we actually start our process with our client, we want to make sure that we really understand their business goals, so we want to make sure we define, you know, what the the end use of the platform would be. You know, how many customers are looking to drive to the platform? Uh, what KPIs are looking to really drive? Um, you know, is taking a life of its own. <laughs> yeah. I think I hit a, too many, I hit a whole bunch of clicks, and then I was finally catching up to where I'm at. Let's see if I can get it to stop. There we go. 
So, um, but the first part is you know, making sure we understand their business goals. Then from there, the, K the KPIs that will be driving it. Uh, and a lot of times we make sure that we revisit these even throughout the project. It's easy to get caught up in all the cool things that we're working and developing and get lost in what the actual goals are for the platform. And then from there, oh yeah, this thing's really taking the life of its own today. <laughs> uh, I think it's trying to uh, move me along. But, uh, but the important parts are once we under really understand the business goals and what are really going to drive the product, we move them through this process where we, you know, a lot of times it is just a piece of paper in the back of, you know, a piece of paper idea. A lot of times where our clients come to us and we're working them through this entire process of the idea to prototype and then once we understand the prototype, what the devices or machines that we need to develop to support it. Uh, so we'll go through and actually identify, do we need a mobile application? Does it need a web administration to manage for business users? So before we actually start the building, in it, uh, building anything, starting to identify which platforms are needed, what are their kind of value that they're bringing to the trifecta, and uh, how do we piece them all together? So if there's any mechanical design, if we actually need to design a unique product, um, do we need to start prototyping it using Raspberry Pis so we can at least start validating it with the customer and within the experience of it before we actually start doing full mechanical design around that particular product? And then any coding that needs to go into that connected device. Uh, then from there, thinking about the middleware service. So if we're developing on some reactor node, thinking about the middleware and how we're going to communicate to the connected devices we're going to put either in the retail or customer experience. And then from there, we start focusing on the mobile application because that's the, the end point of all of the, you know, after we've collected information from the connected devices, it's being passed through some cloud service. It's spit back out through a mobile app in most cases where we're presenting the information that we're collecting or we're presenting it to the consumers or business users. Uh, and, th and then at the end, you take all those things and you have to figure out the right way to start beta, the betaing the, the product for the first time. So uh, for us, we tend to work with the, the customer to find a small subset of these users or find a, a, a partner or client that will allow them to start prototyping if it's a physical product in a space to be able to find some small business unit that allow them to be able to prototype the, the, the platform we're developing with either a small team or with a, a one, one of their clients. Uh, and then from there, we'll validate and kind of reiterate through this process. Uh, so again, you know, really understanding the business is the key part because it's really easy, especially these types of platforms, they really get caught up in the development of them and not focused on the actual end business. And so each step of the way, you know, each week as we're checking with the client, re coming back to the, the business needs and making sure that's the core focus of these products because uh, it's so easy to get caught up in all the fun parts of build, building this stuff. Um, the other thing that's really important is scale. Uh, you know, is it going to be a multi-tenant application? Uh, that becomes really important as you're thinking about platforms of these types of scales. Uh, and so scale does become a really important thing. Uh, you know, and then the other thing as we're thinking about connecting the devices, uh, especially for enterprise, we're seeing a lot more, uh, or, in, which is used to with enterprises, security becomes really important. And a lot of these devices, they don't have uh, traditional standards, especially if you're developing your own device. So really thinking about protocols, uh, how you're securing the endpoints and information being sent back and forth becomes really important to kind of enterprise clients. Uh, and so a lot of times that is developing an on-premise solution and then figuring out the ways that you're communicating back and forth with your connected devices and how you're protecting the information being sent across them becomes really important for a lot of these clients. Um, also, uh, what's interesting too is if you're uh, one, we're talking now with like a venue, uh, access to data, the consistency with latency, things like that becomes important as you're thinking about you know, setting up uh, multiple devices across a building and you know, are there weak spots in the Wi-Fi in certain areas or it doesn't need to rely on data in a consistent way. Uh, really thinking about if you're developing for a facility, you know, what are some special needs for implementing the hardware in, in the space? So making sure that's in mind. Uh, the back end becomes, is in a lot of times, the most important part for these uh, platforms. Really thinking about the moment now where you're prototyping, but thinking a little further down the road, when you're looking to scale this product up or you're looking to roll it out across multiple clients, 
do, or, you know, are you making sure that you're able to, to make it multi-tenant? If it's not multi-tenant, what's your strategy for rolling out for each individual instance uh, and be able to clone and make sure that it's a repeatable process? Um, and that becomes really important. Uh, the other important too is since you're using devices, how you're going to manage the, the number of devices. So if you're walking into a facility with 100 staff versus a facility with 2,000 staff, how are you going to maintain and manage, you know, if we're in one case we're working with a client that's going to be working with meeting rooms, you know, how do you keep track of 100 meeting rooms versus keeping track of 10 meeting rooms? Uh, and how do you track devices in 1,000 meeting rooms? So that becomes really important as you're thinking about the scale and sizes of these types of uh, implementations. Mobile is really important uh, because that's the way that most people will interface with the information that you're presenting. Uh, so UI becomes really important for us in the work that we do. So we spend a lot of time in the user experience, uh, making sure that the onboarding process is really, really seamless. Uh, for many cases, when you're using a product or a multi-channel product, you're going to require third-party integrations. So these are going to be done on the business side, where the business users are going to integrate to Box or Dropbox or some other uh, third-party service, or you're going to allow the users to do that integration with multiple services. So really thinking about how you create a user experience that makes that process really easy, as well as to address any errors that happen when you know, that service fails to, enter or fails to respond to uh, actions that you're firing off within your application. So thinking about errors and thinking about how you allow the users to you know, integrate these third-party services. Uh, analytics becomes really important, and a lot of people really care that once you get all these you know, connected devices up in multiple rooms and you have web apps, they actually want to know if people are using them, you know, how you're tracking the, when we're talking about speech to text and requests using um, bots, you know, what were some of the requests being made, how are you logging those requests so we can, make, uh, we can increase the machine learning or make better intents to help our users guide through kind of a speech to text experience. So, the better that we're learning and the better that we're capturing analytics, the better we can help the, the end user make decisions in improving the platform. Uh, connectivity, again, is really important, uh, especially with these devices. And I think these are the lessons that we've been learning about. You know, as you start developing and prototyping these things, connectivity becomes one of the things that you don't always plan for very well. And so making sure that that's something that's really addressed during the MVP and the prototyping phase is thinking about the con connectivity of the devices that you're developing, as well as the connectivity between the facilities and make sure they have the adequate uh, Wi-Fi and other things that you'll need to make sure that the, the, the product you're developing will be able to stand the test of time. Um, the other thing that's really important too is when you're implementing this for business users, uh, having a very, uh, that you're documenting the process very well. And so for, for this, that's either having a really strong web administrative uh, face for the platform and allows it to make it be really intuitive to understand how they're controlling the devices, how they're controlling requests being made, and how they're integrating and controlling who has access to what. Uh, and that becomes really important with a lot of clients we work with that they want multiple roles and they want full control over the platform, so that becomes really important. But they need all the tools to be able to make those types of decisions. Uh, so we want to talk a, about a couple of, of the products we've been working on and some of the lessons that we've learned through the process. So one of those is Pippin Foods. So they've been working to develop a, a, a platform that takes local goods from farms and gets them into local grocery stores. And so that was, uh, uh, their approach has been uh, multi-channel from the beginning. So having a, a native app for customers so I can download the app and actually see produce and, and within the app, I can see where the produce is coming from. I can see when it arrives to my local store, and I can get notifications once those products arrive to my favorite store. But behind all that is a web administrative platform that allows uh, her and her team to be able to manage orders uh, from the farms to the, the grocery stores. And then for the, the actual grocers, they'll be able to have a QR code scanner that allows them to scan the produce as it comes into the store to be able to fire off the notifications to the customers. And so, uh, and then on top of that, in the actual stores, there's a tablet that's built into each store that allows the customers who come in to actually uh, get a sense of what produce uh, uh, that's on display and where it came from. They're actually on the tablet, be able to see the route that the produce came from farm A to grocery store, it was 14 miles, and here's more information about the farmer. Uh, and so this is one example of developing kind of a multi-channel 
um, product. Uh, and then their next goal is actually to create a connected um, stand within the actual grocery store. So you actually, one problem that we identified early is that there's not a unique SKU for organic or local produce in most grocery stores. So the only way that she can really show value is to be able to additionally show how much money the store is making off of these local produce. And so be able to have her own uh, connected stand that's actually keeping track of sales and the weight and you know, as the weight of the, the, the produce decreases, we know how much of those items are being sold in kind of real time. So that allows her to be able to go back to the grocery store and say, even though you're not able to track the individual SKU for these apples, we can say we've sold you know, X number of pounds of apples each week. And so be able to have that kind of information and analytics is really strong case for her and them to be able to go and make more purchases around local goods and local produce and getting it into their stores. Uh, another example of kind of a trifecta is a platform we've been developing called UMA, which is an a enterprise bot for uh, de deploying speech to text uh, and be able to, one, address issues around uh, visitor management. So if you're coming into a facility for the first time and looking to figure out where a meeting room is or looking for a particular employee to be able to, either through speech or through text, be able to identify, I'm looking for Steve Milner, where does he sit? And be able to say he's on the third floor, and that's all done through this uh, bot interface. Uh, as well as there's other things around Salesforce integration, this platform to be able to fire off help desk tickets and opportunities. Uh, we also developed a, a web administration platform to allow the business users to add additional intents or questions to the bot, as well as to be able to keep track of all the unique intents and questions that are coming in from the bot that we haven't had. Uh, haven't thought about or is unique questions being asked of it, as well as started developing out third-party bots for Spark, uh, Skype for Business, and uh, Slack. So to be able to have a multi-channel bot that works across multiple channels as, as well through a mobile application. Uh, and they have a couple other ideas for other platforms that will de develop this bot for, for in their enterprise clients. So I think with that, if you have any questions, we could dig a little deeper in some of the things that we've learned, have Rakia here from our team, our COO, to talk about some of the other experiences and some of our strategies around some of the, the tricky navigations of building a multi-channel trifecta platform. Yeah, so right now, I think for UMA, we are uh, we're doing a Mongol uh, database. Uh, and right now, it's uh, on the analytics side, we are using Logly uh, as one tool that we're using for keeping track of the actual intent request from the actual users so that we're able to use that and be able to spit that back out to the business users to see all the logs of all the, the questions being fired off to the speech to text bot. And then that in some way, we'll figure out some dynamic way to be able to either feed that back into the machine learning or allow the business users to create new intents around kind of the log and information that being sent to the bot. Yeah. Um, what domains have you know, gone to is it primarily around the lift or manufacturing, construction? Yeah, we're seeing actually on the construction side, we're, we're working with a current client now that's actually doing a lot of interesting things around um, streamlining the, the paper part of the construction business. Right now, like the, for him, he's in the trucking side, all of his paper, so someone calls in the morning from his team to a whole bunch of independent, independent drivers. He, they tell them the jobs. If their truck breaks down, they gotta call the guy in the office and say, my truck broke down. I need, you know, take me off these jobs. It's a very paper and human, um, heavy human process, and so, They've worked to create a portal to kind of manage trucks to be able to, in real time, be able to keep them up to date on their jobs as well as update their jobs in real time. And so I think those are ways that uh, they're, they're able to kind of moder modernize the kind of construction business and then the customer has their own device to be able to submit jobs. So I need rocks and I need rocks tomorrow uh, and I need 20 tons of it. So be able to kind of create a, a new way to kind of, uh, through multiple channels and through mo mobile, tablet, and a web administrative platform, be able to kind of modernize uh, uh, the construction business. So I definitely see there's definitely, I think in traditional businesses, I think they can definitely take advantage of 
these types of approaches in ways that maybe other businesses can't. Sorry, what was your question? Yeah, so yeah, we're actually working on the Android version now. Uh, we started, this was just an MVP project at the beginning, so we were focused mostly on the actual speech to text and the actual service itself. We knew once we got the actual, the, the logic or the bot down, getting it across other platforms was gonna be the easy part. Uh, and so yeah, and that's actually been the case. Once we've actually got the UMA part down, we've been able to really scale into third party bots really easily, uh, particularly using uh, some of the speech to text services out there now. We're very interested in what's happening with Amazon Lex. Uh, we'll see you know, how mature their platform grows really quickly, but uh, the speech to text world is very, very young. And so we've, uh, especially working with a client in, in, the, in Europe, working with different dialects and different languages is still something uh, hard for speech to text, and they're still figuring that out. And so we're relying a little bit more on the text part of UMA versus the actual the voice part just because it's still maturing as a, a industry and, and the software is still not really there to support different languages and accents and dialects. Cool, any other questions? Yeah, I think right now it is mostly around the kind of conversational things. I, we haven't really played with machine learning outside of kind of human interaction. Uh, I definitely think as uh, you're, I think there could be machine learning like in the construction project we're working on that you know, learns the consistency of schedules and then it predicts the next schedule for the next day. I definitely think there's opportunities in other industries to really uh, optimize machine learning and, and hope, hopefully make the process a lot easier and less stress for the business users. But I think for now, mostly our focus has been around conversations and, and learning from the user and figuring out what they're actually asking of you. <laughs> I mean, that, that's one reason why we are focused mostly on JavaScript because it, there's, there's some universality between JavaScript and the multiple uh, platforms. And then it's, as we've been working more on enterprises, JavaScript is a lot easier. It's a lot easier to sell when you're going against enterprise say, hey, we're, we're a JavaScript shop versus you know, Ruby or PHP or any other a language, so I think JavaScript just works better for the types of clients that we work with, as well as with the, the variety of platforms we're working with, JavaScript just makes life a lot easier, to be honest. Yeah, I, <laughs> I guess we're kindred spirits, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it definitely, it's, it's definitely a huge advantage around speed, the other thing too is, I mean, we all know finding tech talent's hard, and so JavaScript just makes it a lot easier to find the talent we're looking for, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Cool, uh, I guess there's no more. Uh, we're here, so we have probably more examples we can talk about. I didn't wanna talk to you guys head off, but uh, if you have any kind of specific questions around stuff you guys been working on, but. We really believe in the trifecta. We know that for our clients moving forward, you have to be able to de develop for multiple channels and multiple platforms. And getting there is hard. Uh, the best way to do it is really taking some of these tools that we talked about today. We, we learned a lot, we made a lot of mistakes, but the, the tools that we presented, they have made the process a lot easier to get these multiple, multiple platform projects off the ground. So thanks for your time.